Hey everybody, it's Lon Seib, and we are back with our monthly sponsored video from Plex. And this month, I thought I would share with you the ways that I use Plex in my day-to-day -day life. I've covered a lot of the features of what the Plex media server can do, and I'm not using all of those features on a regular basis. So I thought it might be fun to look at how I have my server configured, what features I use the most, and get some feedback from you as to how you are using Plex as well. Now, before we get into this, I do want to let you know in the interest of full disclosure that this is a paid sponsorship from Plex. However, they are not reviewing or approving what you're about to see before it gets uploaded, and all the opinions you're about to hear are my own. So let's get into it now and see how I am using Plex in 2022. Now, the server I'm running with is this WD MyCloud PR2100. In full disclosure, WD sent this to the channel to review a little while back, about five and a half years ago now, but it's been working well as my Plex server for that length of time, and I found no need to upgrade it. A bulk of my Plex consumption is done inside the home, but that WD MyCloud does have an Intel processor that supports quick sync video, which allows it to do hardware transcoding. I've done a lot of videos on that, which you'll find link down below in the video description. Now I do update the server on the NAS quite frequently and you can see here that I last did it yesterday at 10.21 a.m. And what'll happen is inside of the Plex web app, you'll get a notification saying a new server is available and the link they'll give you there brings you right to the package that you need for your particular NAS. You download it and then you go over here to install the app manually. A lot of NAS devices have an app store built into them, but I found the versions on the official NAS app stores tend to lag behind the Plex release schedule. So definitely go to Plex directly and download the package from them and install it manually on the NAS that you're using. And you can see all the different NAS versions that they support here. And that way you'll be up to date all the time so whenever a new feature comes out, you will get access to it. Now, one of the things that I've discovered as I get older is that your sense of time begins to get warped a bit. And I had a drive failure about two months ago. And when I looked back at how long that drive was running for, I said, geez, I probably should have been a little more proactive about that. So right now I am running with one of the original drives here, uh, but I had to swap out the drive in position two. In a bit of sacrilege here, I put a Seagate drive into a WD NAS, but it seems to be working fine. Uh, but the drive does run a little hotter than the WD version does. And soon what I'll be doing is pulling out drive one and replacing it with a new disk. Now, what I did here when I first set this thing up uh, was configured the NAS in what's called a RAID 1 configuration. And there are two, as you saw, hard drives inside of this NAS that mirror content from one drive to the other. So if you do have a drive failure like I did, you don't lose your data. But when you are in the rebuilding phase, which took about a day and a half or two days to complete, you are at risk if the other drive fails. So having a good backup of your media is really important. So you might want to get an additional hard drive to act as an external backup for your NAS device just in case you lose both drives uh, during one of those transition periods or from some other calamity. You can see here I have auto rebuild on, so when I do swap out drive one and put in a new one, it's going to automatically get everything loaded onto that new drive and we won't see any interruption. Uh, what I discovered was that I had not enabled the audible alarm for a drive failure. So we were running off of one drive for a couple of weeks before I even knew that there was a problem. We didn't even notice it. So these things really are something you should pop in and just take a look at every once in a while to make sure everything is in good shape. And I do that because I'm frequently updating the Plex server, which gives me the opportunity to check on the health of the drives. Now, irrespective of what you run your server on, my advice would be to use a NAS rated hard drive these tend to be a little more robust than a standard consumer drive because they are designed to run 24-7. WD calls their drives Reds, uh, and Seagate calls theirs Iron Wolf. There are SSDs available now that are NAS rated too, which certainly will be very quick, but because SSDs at high capacities are so expensive, you're likely going to be sticking to the spinning variety. And I found over the years that the NAS drives really hold up well over time. 
so well that sometimes you forget that you've got a spinning hard disk that might be getting long in the tooth. So again, checking up on your drive health is very critical. Now, while the WD MyCloud PR2100 can do hardware video transcoding, it is limited mostly to H.264 and MPEG-2 at this point. So if you take a look at this chart, which you can find at lon.tv slash quicksyncwiki, you can see each Intel processor family and the types of video it can work with in its hardware transcoder. So the best I can do here is HEVC as a decode. So I could, for example, decode a regular 4K HEVC file and transcode it to H.264 1080p without many issues. But once we get into some of the things you might find on 4K Blu-ray, for example, you're going to run into trouble. So a bulk of the things that I watch outside of the house are mostly 1080p, and that's why I haven't felt the need to upgrade any further. But if you are building out something on your own or shopping for a new NAS, this chart might be really helpful in determining what chips can do what, uh, depending on the video codec that you're working with. And as a reminder, I've covered these topics in great detail down below in the video description if you are currently researching a server to work with. Now, if you are intending to only do video inside of the home, you don't really need anything all that powerful. So in many cases, an entry-level Synology NAS can even deliver 4K Blu-ray content over your network because you're going to rely on the player to do the decoding. And that brings us to how I am watching Plex content in the house. My go-to player is still the NVIDIA Shield. In fact, many of my TVs have the 2015 version of the Shield on them. But for my television upstairs in my home theater room, I did upgrade to the newest NVIDIA Shield Pro. And the reason I did that is because the new Shield Pro can pass along Dolby Vision content inside of videos that you have stored on your Plex server and the older ones cannot. So if you do have a newer 4K television and you want to watch Dolby Vision content from Plex, that newer Shield is going to be the way to go. Let me show you though how I have my Shields configured on the televisions because irrespective of what version I am running with, they all are configured the same way. Let's have a look. So let's take a look at the settings that I have on this shield, which by the way is a 2015 edition, but still going strong. We use this one for demos down here. And one thing that I like to look at first is to make sure that your home streaming is set to maximum. This is usually the default setting, but it's always good just to make sure that it's set to maximum so that you don't force any transcoding. The NVIDIA Shield remains, after seven years, the most powerful streaming device you can get insofar as formats are concerned. And so there's no need to really do any transcoding of video inside of your home. Uh, there is an option here for remote streaming, and this is something you might want to adjust depending on the servers that you're connecting to. So for example, I'm on this crazy fiber optic connection at my house now. A friend of mine around the corner has it as well. And because we have super high speed bandwidth, we actually set our remote streaming quality to maximum because we can play at the full bit rate even across town, which is pretty cool. And I did a video about that a little while back. Uh, what I want to do though is point your attention down here to the advanced section. This is a very important option, the pass through option. And you wanna set that for HDMI. And what this will do is pass through the highest quality audio to your television or to your home theater receiver. And even the older shields here will support lossless audio, both for DTS and for Dolby. And that includes Dolby Atmos audio coming off of a Blu-ray uh, file that you might have. And that includes even the older version of the shield which is awesome, but you wanna make sure that that pass-through is enabled so your receiver will get that raw data. Another thing that I find extremely important is refresh rate switching. I have this set to on, and the reason why you want this on is because most movies are shot at 24 frames per second, so to get the movie exactly the way that the director intended, you want your shield to switch its frame rate to 24 frames per second when you play back that content. And that is what 
this setting does. Oddly, uh, this is something that the Shield doesn't do that well with a lot of the streaming apps that you might get from Netflix or Disney Plus and others, but it does great here with Plex, provided you have that enabled. Uh, this next one is up to you for resolution switching. I often just rely on my LG OLED TV's upscaler to bring a 1080p video up to its native resolution, but you can have the Shield do that as well. I don't do all that much with the uh, AI upscaling that's on the new Shield, but that's another option you could look at as well. Uh, but I generally leave resolution switching uh, on in most cases, even though right here it is off. And some of these other settings are things that you might need to adjust. But really the big ones here are the pass-through and the refresh rate switching to get the best home theater experience out of your Shield. Now in the Shield's display settings, you want to make sure that your television's HDR settings have been detected properly. That includes HDR10 and Dolby Vision. Remember that only the 2019 Shields and up work with Dolby Vision, but the older Shields all the way back to 2015 support HDR10. Additionally, one thing I like to ensure is enabled here is the ability to switch the content color space automatically in the Shield. And you can find that in the advanced settings here and just make sure that the content color space here is checked on. Now, over the last couple of weeks, I've been playing around with the Apple TV and the Xbox One. Both of those as clients are improving, but they are still not as feature complete as what you're going to find here on the Shield. So the Shield is still my go-to, and I hope that NVIDIA keeps making them because if they stop, we're gonna be out of options really quick for the best Plex experience. So my advice is, is that if you need an extra Shield, keep buying them just so that NVIDIA knows that there are people that are using this thing out there. I'd hate for this product to leave the marketplace. Now, as far as media is concerned, it is mostly movies and TV shows on my server, but I have been building up my music collection on the Plex server as well. Both my wife and I have a lot of great CDs from the late 80s and 90s that we have been archiving slowly over time in FLAC format, so it's lossless. And there are certain devices that we have directly wired into speakers to get that full range of sound out of those CDs. They definitely sound better than a lot of the streaming services do, so it's nice to have the ability to store that FLAC audio somewhere and have a nice way to interact with it. And I'll show you another way we're doing that in a little bit. Now the MyCloud is doing double duty because it also works as a DVR, so it can record content in addition to just storing it. And we are using for a tuner the HD Home Run Prime that I bought way back, I think, in 2013 or so. And that thing is still cranking away. The exact same one that I largely launched my channel with is the same device that is still providing TV to my home today. It sits in the closet over there and works diligently. The one that I have is the Prime version that allows you to connect it up with your cable TV service through a cable card. And that cable card comes from Comcast. I've done a lot of content on that in the past. Because the HD Home Run software came out before the Plex DVR did, my wife, being a creature of habit, prefers to use the HD Home Run interface. But what I've done is pointed Plex at the folder where the HD Home Run content gets recorded so I can get access to this stuff when I am not at home. Now, a lot of this comes over Comcast cable now, which is recording as just a straight up H.264 file but the things coming from my local affiliates like CBS and ABC and whatnot are being stored still as MPEG-2 files, which the transcoder on the MyCloud can handle quite easily when I am out and about watching remotely. Now, one thing I do quite a bit, though, is tune live TV over Plex when I am not at home, especially if I'm traveling and want to catch up on my local news back uh, at the house here and I can use my phone for that. So when I'm out on the road, I can just pull up the Plex app, go into the live TV section, and I have access to all of the channels that I can watch when I'm sitting here at home, and the Plex server on the MyCloud will automatically transcode things based on network conditions, so I can watch even if I am just on a cellular connection. What I like is they recently integrated the free Plex channels that stream from Plex servers uh, into this as well. So everything is kind of in one spot. 
and then you can actually set favorites here so you can mix and match your cable channels along with the Plex channels, and we covered that recently here on the channel. Another thing that I like is that if I am remote, I can set things to record, and the reason why this is nice is because the HD Home Run software doesn't really allow for that. So if I am out somewhere and forgot to record something, I can record it here and have it drop into my Plex library. Now recently we covered how you can add multiple tuners to the mix if you want to do that. My HD Home Run tuner can tune into three things simultaneously, but if I needed to add more slots, I could bring in another tuner. I could mix and match an over-the-air tuner with my cable one, for example, and you can find a list of compatible tuners by operating system on the Plex support page here. Now in full disclosure, Silicon Dust, the makers of the HD Home Run are an occasional sponsor here on the channel as well, but I've been using their product for much longer than they've been a sponsor. It's a really solid platform, and what I like about it is that you can use it with just about any software that is compatible. You're not locked into one platform, and you can use multiple pieces of software with their tuners at the same time, like I am doing here. Now I'm starting to travel a bit more, so I've been downloading TV shows onto my phone to watch while I am in transit using the Plex download feature. We covered this in detail, also again down below in the video description, but I can jump in here and select for this show, for example, to get uh, maybe the five latest episodes that I haven't seen yet, and Plex will manage that storage for me by deleting the episode that I watched and downloading another one that I haven't yet seen. And it's nice to have my phone all loaded up and ready to go uh, before I get on an airplane or a train or something. Now, as I mentioned, my wife and I have been loading in our CD collection into the Plex server as lossless FLAC files. The audio sounds great, provided you are hardwired in. Bluetooth headphones do introduce some compression, so you lose a little bit there. But when you're up on the home theater system upstairs, you can load it up on your shield. And because the shield is hardwired into the stereo system, we get the full quality of the audio on my fancy setup upstairs. Additionally, I use the Plex Amp app on my phone, which is awesome. It is from Plex, but it's a separate app, and I've covered it in the past. They've got a lot of neat visualizations here. It works with your Plex server, so you can navigate things uh, without having to rebuild your organizational strategy, and they've got a lot of neat little AI features that allow you to listen to songs that sound similar depending on your mood and all sorts of cool stuff. Definitely worth checking out. Uh, remember though, if you want to get the best audio quality from your phone, you will need to attach headphones directly to it. And if your phone lacks a headphone jack like this one, you'll need to get a lightning to headphone adapter so that you're not using any kind of wireless protocol that might mess up the audio in the process. But we have been enjoying our music because we can listen to it with the same exact quality we used to listen to it back in the 90s. So that is how I am using Plex at the moment. This is software that I use every single day to interact with my media. And there are certainly many more features which we have covered in that playlist in the video description for you to explore. And I would love to hear how you are using Plex day to day because that might help inform future content here on the channel. I want to thank Plex for their long-standing support of what we do here. And until next time, this is Lon Seibin. Thanks for watching. This channel is brought to you by the Lon.TV supporters, including Gold Level supporters Jim Tannis and Tom Albrecht, Hot Sauce and Video Games and Eric's Variety Channel, Brian Parker and Frank Goldman, Amda Brown and Matt Zagaya, and Chris Allegretta. If you want to help the channel, you can by contributing as little as a dollar a month. Head over to lon.tv slash support to learn more. And don't forget to subscribe. Visit lon.tv slash s.